Red Coats and Petticoats, written by Catherine Kirkpatrick, illustrated by Ronald Hemmler. When the war came to our village of Setauket, Long Island, the Redcoats made our church into a fort. Cannonballs whistled through the air. The village green was alive with hurrying people. The worst was soon to come. One night there was a loud rapping on our door. Two redcoats flung open the door and grabbed my father. Traitor, I heard one of them say, holding a musket to his head. Father called to me as the redcoats took him away. Thomas, help your mother take care of the family. The next day a company of redcoats moved into our house. They sat on our chairs and slept in our beds. Noisy voices came at us from every direction. Mother's eyes grew fiery when a tall soldier sitting at our table licked his fingers as he finished gnawing on a chicken bone. That was our dinner, she scolded. Mother's parents, Grandmother Martha and Grandfather Tanger Smith, urged us to come live with them. Mother refused. These things wouldn't have happened to your family if you remained loyal to our king, Grandfather said. I'm sorry, but I have my principles, Mother argued. Our family moved nearby to a little cottage on the water, across from Abraham Woodall's farm. What's living in a big house? Well, have it back when the war ends, Mother told us. Soon after that, Mother started to do odd things. Thomas, take your rowboat and go out to the Conscious Bay. See if you can find a whaleboat anywhere about. Why? I asked. Mother refused to answer. Instead, she hummed to herself as she washed my sister's red petticoats in a wooden basin. Don't forget your fishing pole, she added. Conscious Bay was a long way to row just to go fishing. Was Mother becoming touched in the head? Rowed along the narrow marshy beaches, hugging close to the shoreline. A few schooners were sailing in the harbor that day, as well as many smaller vessels. I looked up on a hill and saw above the trees the fires of a camp. Then I noticed small figures in the distance. They were wearing red. As I drifted back to the bank, I saw the redcoats watching me. I quickened my strokes and rode through a narrow channel into Conscience Bay. The coves wove in and out of the shore like fingers on a hand. There was no whaleboat in sight. I had made my long trip for nothing. Turned home after passing the redcoats a second time, my mother asked me, Did you see the whaleboat? No, I did not, but I saw the redcoats camp on the shore. Oh, those scoundrels! They're everywhere. Tomorrow I'd like you to return to the bay to look for the whaleboat. But, Mother, I don't see why, I protested. I did not want to admit I was afraid. Mother looked up from hanging my sister's red petticoats on the line. She gave me a look that meant she was serious. You are helping your father, she said. If you see the red coats again, why don't you wave to them? The next day I brought my brother Ben with me. While we caught enough bluefish for our family's supper, I wondered how my search for a whaleboat could possibly help my father. I wondered where the red coats had taken him. On the return trip home, we passed by the red coats camp. There were more soldiers than I had ever seen before at one time. A group of five walked toward the beach. They carried muskets. You boys, what are you doing here? A tall red coat called. It was the same tall red coat who lived in my old house. I was too frightened to speak. Instead, I waved to him as we rode by. Did you see the whaleboat boys? Mother asked expectantly. No, I answered. I was angry. There are red coats all over the shore. I can't go out to Conscience Bay without rowing past them. I wish you would tell me what's happening. Mother sighed. Sometimes it's not safe for me to tell you everything, she said as she hugged me. You're a brave boy, Thomas, and I know your father would be proud of you, she added. Then she hugged her red petticoats on the line. Why are you doing so much wash, I asked. Oh, there's always wash to be done, Mother answered vaguely. I saw that one of the petticoats mother was hanging was actually dry. The war was surely affecting her. The following morning, my mother sent me out to look for the whaleboat again. I approached the redcoat's camp, keeping under cover of the trees as long as I could. The tall redcoat was there, along with several companions. Boy, come here, he said. His face was round and ruddy and under the high hat. I was just a few strokes from the beach. What have we here? Clams? 
I'd like some clams for my lunch. Bring them up to us, another red coat called out. Carrying the bucket of clams, I climbed the hill to the camp. I stood in the center of the hill, surrounded by soldiers in bright red uniforms. I breathed hard. Should we arrest him? The tall red coat asked, then laughed wildly. He took my bucket of clams. Go on with you. Bring us some more bluefish next time. As I rounded the corner of the cove toward Conscience Bay, I saw the slender whaleboat in the shallows ahead of me. It was no ordinary whaleboat. At the bow, a man in a three-pointed hat operated a swivel gun. The whaleboat held Patriot soldiers. My whole body trembling, I rowed home as fast as my boat could take me. Mother, I saw the whaleboat, I called out. I ran, stumbling toward her. Mother's eyes brightened. She embraced me, pressing her cheek against mine. Keep your voice low, she said gently. She asked me to tell her exactly where I had seen the whaleboat. Mother hung her black petticoat on the clothesline. I helped her hang the handkerchiefs. Only three handkerchiefs today, Thomas, she said. I looked at her. Don't ask questions, she said. A gust of wind rose up from the sound. The petticoat on the clothesline made a loud, flappy noise as the wind tossed it back and forth. I made many trips to Conscience Bay that summer, by boat in fair weather and by foot when it rained. Sometimes I spotted the whaleboat, sometimes not. Whenever the tall red coat saw me, I had to give him all my fish. Mother continued to, continued to do the laundry. As the weeks passed, I began to doubt that father would ever come home. One day, as we were picking corn from our garden, Abraham Woodall, the farmer who lived across the water from us, came to visit. I overheard him whispering to Mother, Nancy, your husband was taken to the Jersey prison ship in New York Harbor. Mother's face flushed. I knew he was still alive. That same afternoon, Mother took us to visit my grandparents. I did not like it when my mother closed the door of the parlor to, take, to talk to Grandfather privately. When Mother came out of the room, she had a sealed letter in her hands. A few more weeks went by before Mother had any new ideas. Then, as we brought in our garden, garden's last big harvest, I was surprised to hear Mother say, You and I go, are going on a journey, Thomas. My sister, Katora, would stay home to care for the younger children. Brothers and sisters and I loaded armfuls of corn, beans, turnips, squash, and potatoes into our family's wagon. What are we doing with these, I asked. You'll see, Mother replied. Aren't we fortunate the redcoats haven't come by to take them? These vegetables are very valuable, Thomas. Because of the war, there are many people who haven't seen vegetables in over a year. The road was muddy and rutted. Sometimes I rode on horseback, sometimes I followed the cart on foot. We ate potatoes for our supper and slept with our shoes on in the wagon's soft hay. I lay awake listening to the chirping of crickets and the occasional gunshot. Where are we going? I asked mother. To find your father, she answered. After three days, mother and I arrived at New York Harbor. The seas were high and choppy. The Jersey prison ship appeared as a dark, ugly hulk. Redcoats approached us carrying muskets. Chin high, mother talked to the officer and handed him her letter. She smiled at him flirtatiously. This woman has influential Tory family members, the officer murmured after reading the letter. The officer called to his men to load the vegetables into one of the supply boats. The supply boat took the officer and the vegetables out to the Jersey. I could smell the rotten stench from the prison ship. Squatting men, gaunt as skeletons, were scrubbing its deck. Mother and I waited anxiously. When the boat returned, father was in it. My father had been traded for the vegetables. Father, I called out. He was pale and dressed in rags, but he was still father. He broke into a big grin when he saw me. I knew everything was going to be all right. Father returned to our family, but only for a short time. The tall redcoat and two of her, his companions came to our cottage looking for him. Father heard the sound of their horses, ran down to the beach, and hid in the tall marsh grass. Mother stood up straight, unafraid, while the redcoat searched our cottage. I had never been so frightened. Next day, Father and I rode together to Conscience Bay, where the whaleboat was waiting for him. Thomas, I'm going to... Connecticut until the war ends, he told me. I felt so sad that I couldn't say goodbye to him. 
When next I saw father, I was as tall as he was. I was no longer a boy. The war ended, and at last father came home to stay. We moved back into our old house, and we were happy to be together again as a family. To celebrate the Redcoats' departure, the people of Sautiket gathered on the village green and roasted an ox. Later, George Washington toured Long Island. I met him when he stopped in our village. He bowed to my mother and said, I've come here to thank you, spies, who have helped us to win the war. I was shocked. I couldn't have done it without the help of my son Thomas, she said. What? A spy? How? I asked. A whaleboat took secret messages across the, the sound to Connecticut, where General Washington was, she said. I signaled the location of the whaleboat to another spy, Abraham Woodall. But the whaleboat wasn't always hidden in the same place. I had to know its whereabouts. That's where you came in, Thomas. What was their signal? asked George Washington. Mother smiled. She wouldn't answer. She liked to hold her secrets close. But I knew it was her petticoats.